but let's uh, let's start with a quick question: What happens when a medhab ruling seems to be the exact opposite of a hadith? In other words, I'm a regular guy. I read a hadith. It says one, two, three. The ruling says the exact opposite. The ruling from a certain school of thought says the exact opposite. What do we do? Okay. Why is that the case? Now, let's ask a question. Could it possibly be that the imam knew the ruling and said, you know what? I'm going to go exact opposite of the Prophet wasallam. Now, we know that that's not possible, right? He wouldn't be an imam acceptable in the community, deemed righteous, etc., if... You see, okay, the prophet's going this way. You know what? I'm going to go the opposite way. So we know that's not the case, right? All right, could it possibly be that the imam didn't know the hadith, right? In which case, we should ask the question, how did you get qualified as an imam? If you didn't know these hadith, okay? If it was something so obvious that here we are, you know, much later, it's so obvious to us, then your imamat should be in question. Not only your imamat, well, what about all your followers? Were they just being stubborn? Were all your followers just saying, you know what, our imam didn't know, but we're going to cover it up. And we're going to not admit that. And we're just going to dig our heels in and contradict the Prophet, peace be upon him. Is that the other option? That's also, you wouldn't have a righteous forebears if that was the case. Our predecessors would not have been righteous people then, if that's the case. The the form, the 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 foundations of the madhabs is not one imam; it's many many imams. It's one imam and dozens upon dozens of students and hundreds upon every generation of students. So for us to imagine now that they dug their heels in to contradict the prophet to support their imam who was ignorant, that also causes actually ends up being an analysis that's a one very hard to prove but b it kills the whole history of islam like our history of our scholarship was some stubborn people if that's the case ignorant people who dug their heels in so most likely the answer is and we can find this in the literature the debate literature scholars have debates with one another and there are books that are known as al-mutawwalat, which are very long books in which debates take place, okay? In which they're, they're, these debates uh, are cited. Even a book like Qurtubi cites the debates. He cites the back and forth. The Shafi'i say this, the Hanafi said that, the Maliki said this. Chances are the Imam had a stronger evidence, okay? A stronger hadith, so you may have come upon a hadith. Yes, you did come upon a hadith, but you didn't come upon all the hadith. There's a stronger hadith out there that you're not, not aware of. So it's funny that, oh my gosh, the imam didn't know about the hadith. Also look in the mirror. Maybe you also didn't know about some evidences, right? Why? It seems to be egotistical for us to come this far down in Islamic history and say, boom, he didn't know the hadith. Maybe also you don't know a lot of things about the evidences that they used, Okay. So that's one thing. Secondly, it could be a Quranic verse and certain hadiths and certain scholars differ on whether certain hadiths can provide exceptions to Quranic verses or not. All right, let me give you a simple example. The Madikis and the, and the Hanafis did not hold that a solitary hadith can provide an exception to a Quranic verse. Okay, the Quranic verse is mutawatir. Okay, it's more authoritative than one single narration that does that lacks context and explanation. So what they did, for example, on Juma, when Juma, when Eid falls on Juma, what's the ruling there? The ruling there for the Hanafis and the Madikis is, is that you must pray Juma. The Shafi'iyya and I don't know about the Hanabila, but the Shafi'iyah, Imam al-Shafi'i, he took a different approach than his pre previous two teachers. He said, no, even if we have one single narration, we will use that as an exception for the Qur'an. So there is a narration in which the Prophet ﷺ told some people that if Eid is on a Jummah, they don't have to come back. Okay, for Jummah, I pray the hood in their homes. 
So what did Abu Hanifa and Malik say about that hadith? They say, we didn't see any of the previous generations practicing that. So we don't deny that it happens, but we don't know the context. Was it an exception? Was there a specific thing? Was it abrogated later on? We don't know. So we don't deny that the hadith took place, but we don't have enough information around it okay, to make a ruling by it. And the companions and the tabi'een and the tabi'i tabi'een, none of their leaders practiced it. They all prayed Jummah on Eid. As a result of that, we accept it as a sahih hadith, but we can't use it as evidence. We're going to use the action of the companions and the tabi'een as a greater evidence. Now, the actions of the companions, is that not the sunnah? When a whole generation of companions is doing something, is that not the teaching of the Prophet, peace be upon him? Okay, So, so that's the first understanding, is that there was another evidence that's stronger than that. Okay, what's next? It could have been abrogated. We already alluded to that. It could have been abrogated. So when the companions see, when an imam sees that there is an isolated hadith, one narration to do X, but we find none of the companions or the second generation doing X, then what do they assume? They assume maybe it was abrogated. Because why is it that the action is different okay, of the most noble of generations and this narration so they so it's not to say that the narration is rejected it's to say there is not enough information around it and there is contradictory information to it in other words the actions of the next two generations is contradictory to it so as a result of that we're just going to suspend it and we're not going to act upon it. we're going to act upon what's stronger yeah okay? i'm going to assume possibly it was abrogated another possibility was an exception so for example the Raising of the hands, even the clasping of the hands, to take an, an, as an example. Madik himself cites the hadith of the clasping of the hands. But his madhab is to put the hands down in the prayer. So we need to know, like, hey, don't drive me crazy here. We're following the Prophet. The hadith is right there. Why are you ruling the opposite? So the answer is, is that oftentimes a hadith is deemed to be an exception to the rule, not the rule itself. Okay. And what's an example of that? In other narrations, they state that the Sahaba were praying long nawafil and the Prophet and their hands were getting numb. And so the Prophet said, said, clasp your hands as an exception, as a ruhsa when you're praying long prayers to clasp your hands so that your hands don't get numb. The blood is coming down to their hands so it's the idea that a narration is accepted but it's known to be an exception versus the rule right and that's why a madhab ruling may seem to be quite opposite the Siyulti mentions that Imam Malik has dozens of hadiths that he puts in the muatta that he doesn't rule by because he's basically putting them in the muatta saying I know these are exceptions these are not the rule okay Another famous hadith is al bayani bil khiyari ma lam yatafarraqa. A very uh, f- funny example that a man came to Imam Malik and he said, Malik, when can two people who buy and sell something make a deal retract? He says, they can. As soon as they make the deal, it's done. Okay? He says, but Malik, you yourself cite the hadith in the muatta that two people they can retract their deal that they made okay as long as they're still sitting together right he says i cited that hadith so that an ignorant person like you doesn't come and tell me one day that there is such a hadith i knew that hadith okay but i have a stronger evidence from it there's a stronger evidence to that okay and so Again, you have any, uh, situations where the imam may know a hadith and cite it himself, but he's citing it to make people know, I know it, and I have a stronger evidence for it than it. Okay, so what's another example? Uh, how about that the narrator may act differently from what he narrated? What happens when that occurs? The narrator says one thing. He says, the prophet said, do this. But he doesn't do it. So clearly... He viewed it as a minor uh, uh, fadila or maybe an exception. And the famous example of Abdullah bin Omar, who narrates the hadith of raising the hands before the Quran and after the Quran. So maybe he was saying the Prophet did it once or twice. 
but as an exception, not the rule. Because he himself was narrated that he didn't do it. He narrated the hadith, but he didn't do it. Okay? We have other examples of this. And bigger issues. How about Sayyidina Ali and the, Khar- and the Khawarij? Did not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, if I was alive when the Khawarij came out, I would kill them all? Who narrates that hadith? Sayyidina Ali. Who was alive ruling when the Kharijites came out? Sayyidina Ali. Did he kill them all? No, he didn't kill them all. So what did he do? Just ignore the Prophet's hadith? Or he understood it in a context, okay? That it, with conditions maybe, all right? Yes, he would do that if there were conditions. The condition being that there wouldn't be greater harm than good, right? Common sense says that. So Sayyidina Ali knew the hadith. The Prophet said, if the, who are the Kharijites? The rebels. They think they're more pious than everybody else and they rebel against the authority, Okay? Those are the Khawarij, rebels. And they have a political and a religious element to them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if I was alive, I would kill all of them. Yeah, they're the, the rebels. They just, they're going to cause problems in the ummah. So Sayyidina Ali narrates the hadith, and Sayyidina Ali is ruling when the Kharijites emerge, as the Prophet prophesied. But he didn't kill them. He said they can go and live in their mosques, uh, in their villages, and pray in their message, and as long as they leave us alone, the moment they start killing us, then we fight them. So the so Sayyidina Ali understood the conditions, the preconditions before the implementation of the Prophet's hadith. And of course, he did, in a certain period of time, the Battle of Nahawan did fight them. Okay, he did fight them. But before that and after that, he let them live. So he understood the conditions. So again, the, another reason is that yes, there may be a hadith and a ruling in a madhab, but the hadith has understood conditions around it. Why are we saying all this is because the best way for you students of knowledge, brand new students of knowledge, this whole live stream, the purpose of this live stream is to introduce Muslims to the path of knowledge and piety and worship. The best way to go about this is to study the four imams, choose who you believe is most worthy of following that's the ijtihad the, the the scholarly effort of the common person and then follow that person because we don't have time we don't have the time of day to study every single issue and get to the bottom of every single issue but we can study the imams and their methodologies and then it becomes a function after that so this is the imam and the methodology that i believe is most worthy of following and then after that i'm going to follow him and i could study his evidences as much as i can but now me, my life, my family, my community, my household, my masjid, we have a policy. This is the book. And it's all predictable after that. And trust me, when you go to communities who adopt a non-medheb methodology, by the way, that is a methodology, you, you don't see learned people. You see confused people. You see people ping-ponging of opinions all over, all over the place. Okay. Now, by the way, when someone says, I just follow the hadith and that's it, that's a methodology. You've adopted a methodology. So it's not like you are not following a method. That is a method. Okay. Now let's ask this question. Um, uh, when we talk about imams not knowing the hadith, is it possible? Yes, we, I think we mentioned this. It is possible, but usually it emerges in debates that they, did, they were aware of a hadith. And they still chose a different evidence. What the hadith that you imagine to be the only hadith on the issue is probably not. So most likely, what you're projecting upon the imam, ignorance, is probably also going to rebound back to you, ignorance. You don't know his evidences. Okay. Number two is that we actually can hold that an imam didn't know something. And when we do hold that, we usually hold it because one of his close followers... Okay, or he himself admits it. All right, that's how that's how we do know that. All right, and for example, Abdul Rahman ibn Qasim is one of Imam Madik's greatest students. He is one of those who says that um, in certain cases, if Madik knew this, he would rule like this. So when someone who studied with Madik for decades says he didn't know this hadith then we can accept that. That we can accept, right? Because there's a reason to accept that. But just, 
not seeing him act upon that hadith or rule by that hadith or cite that hadith uh, for us to then say he didn't know it, it's, there's, not, there's not much to support that claim of ignorance. It's very hard to claim a negative.